We have an evangelist that is truly an evangelist. He goes out in the streets. He doesn't have a title with his, a badge with his name on it and it says Evangelist of Hope Christian Fellowship, but he hits, he hits the streets. And he probably sometimes aggravates you because he's always asking you to help him and do something. Uh, only because the world is dying. Souls are going to hell quickly. Um, the streets are not safe. We're, we're at, a, at a pace that we're going to break the record of homicides this year. I wonder how many of them are in the presence of God today. Brother Julio has been a part of our church for many years now, and he has been faithful in this calling that God has called him to as an evangelist. And so I've asked him this morning to come and share the Word of God, and I know that you're going to be blessed. So let's kind of put our hands together. Let's welcome him as he comes and shares God's Word. Amen. Thank you, church. If we could go to Luke chapter 16, and we're going to hold our place there. This, this message that is, is going to be served today, it's, um, it's going to be like a roller coaster. So I'm giving you the warning. A roller coaster in the sense that at first we're going to go up like what spiritual truths. You're going to feel encouraged and uplifted. But and then you're going to be weighed down with spiritual truths. But I want you to stick in there and hang, hang in. And then you're going to be uplifted one more time to close out the message with spiritual truths again. So Luke chapter 19, and we're going to hold our positions there. So this message is titled, The Great Separation. Church, there's going to come a time, and we see now that there's tough times, hard times. In Rochester, uh, murder is rampant. Uh, we, we've even had suicide. Uh, uh, you know, that's been part two, of, 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 unfortunately, of our, of our local church. We've had depression, anxiety. We've had all these things, right? But there will come a time for us that are in Christ Jesus where we will be with the Father, when we will see Christ Jesus face to face, and these issues and these problems will be no more. Church, there's going to be a time where there isn't going to be no more depression. There isn't going to be no more anxiety. There isn't going to be no more violence. There is going to be no more, uh, um, you know, the, the wedlock, all these sins that are happening. There's going to be a time where we will reign with Christ, where we would see him face to face. Hallelujah. What a glorious time that will be, that there will be no more sorrows, that there will be no more sickness, that there will be no more struggles with sin. Man, that's worth it all to give our lives to Christ. That's worth it all to give our lives to Christ, church. Hallelujah. And most of all, there will be no more death. No more death. Wow. How amazing is that? I want to remind this church, the way that we are right with God is not based on anything we have done. Actually, what we have done shows us that we need God's help. For all have sinned, remember church, and fallen short of God's glory, right? Christ died for us to make us right with the Father, right? And so in turn, we are right with God right now as we speak because of Jesus Christ dying for us on our behalf on the cross. This is how we have a new life. This is how we're new people in Jesus Christ. It's all because of what God did for us. Now, as a result, this is why our lives change. This is how we become a new person, a new creature, right? Therefore, all things have passed away. Behold, all things are made new. We're new in Jesus Christ. And this is why we live differently. This is why we share the gospel with others. This is why we, we treat our spouses and people with respect. This is why we forgive because our Heavenly Father shows us an example of forgiveness. Hallelujah. 
Now the problem is this. This is the spiritual low, spiritual truths now. The people who won't be with this church because they're not under the umbrella of Jesus Christ. They're not forgiven of all sins. Are going to be some of our mothers. Some of our fathers. Some of our kids. They won't be with us in glory. Some of our co-workers. The people at the gym. The people at the grocery store. The people you drive past. The people in your neighborhoods. The people in the worst neighborhoods with all the stabbings and shootings and all these things. These people are going to their final destination faster and sooner than many. Also, there's people in good neighborhoods that have their lives together, so to speak, but they don't see the weight of their sin. They don't see their need for Jesus Christ. And they're also perishing and going to hell. Hell, in the Hebrew, is Sheol. It's to the grave. And we're going to be now going down to Luke 16. In the Greek, it's Hades. Hades is a place of the dead. But this is a place that wasn't for, it wasn't meant for people at all at first. Jesus said this was meant for Satan and his angels or Satan and the demons or the devils. It wasn't meant for, for them. So we're going to go to Luke 16 and we're going to go on verse 19. So hell is a place of, 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 of weeping, of gnashing of teeth. It's extremely hot. It's not a fun place. It's not a party place. And so I, I, I find it sobering to remind us why we share the gospel. Eternity is a long time, longer than any one of us could fathom, okay? It's an extremely long time. We get tired and bored waiting for an hour, two hours. Eternity that we won't see these people that I've listed is an extreme long time. So Luke chapter 16 and verse 19. So this is about Lazarus and the rich man. Jesus is telling the story to disciples and also Pharisees that are on the mix. Jesus is saying this, and I, I believe this is the true story, and this is why, and other scholars as well, because Jesus is using real names, as we will see. He, he gives Lazarus the name. He see, you see Abraham is there. You see them also talking about Moses coming uh, to, to, and the prophets. Okay, so this is, you know, you're seeing all these things, right? You're seeing actual names. Or usually Jesus' parables, his other stories, don't mention names. This one is specifically with names. So I believe this to be not a metaphor. I believe this to be true. Okay? This is my understanding, my personal study uh, of this. All right? So now we'll go to verse 19. Now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, enjoyed himself in splendor every day. Next verse. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores. So there's a gate. Lazarus couldn't get in. And no longer, or no, he longed, I mean, to be fed from the uh, scraps which fell up from the rich man's table. Not only that, the dog also were coming and licking his sores. So he was looking. He was hungry. Lazarus is hungry. He's like, man, could I, if I could at least get some of that. The, the scraps that are falling down from this table. Okay. Now it happened that the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's arms. And the rich man also died and was buried. So real quick, we'll stop there for now. I want to show us now that when they both died, they're, they're going to two different destinations. Okay. The reason why the Lazarus, okay, is going to Abraham's bosom. This is Jesus telling the story. This is before Jesus Christ dies on the cross, okay. When Jesus dies on the cross, he caught at another place called paradise. And I, I'm not, I'm not going to focus much on where the saints are going. I'm actually going to focus on the opposite. 
I'm going to focus on where we used to, where we were going, where the ungodly people are going, and that's intentional. So I'm not going to go so much into what's going to happen to the believers in Christ. We're actually going to really observe what's happening to the non-believers. Um, that's that's my, the point of this, okay? So that rich man, he didn't go to Abraham's bosom, all right? He went to, uh, he was buried, okay, next verse. And in Hades, so again, Hades, Sheol, uh, those will be used interchangeably. He raised his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham from afar and Lazarus in his arms. And he cried out, this is the rich man, and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am in agony in this flame. There's no party. He's in agony in this flame, okay, which that's something that we, we can't even fathom. Uh, I have a, a, a grandfather who passed away that he got burnt, okay, and that was just for a fraction of time. His skin, okay, you could see that his skin was, was deteriorated. It, was, it, it looked really bad, okay, but that was a fraction of time. We're talking about now from when this person died, okay, when Jesus said this story, when that person died, even till this day, right, this rich man will still be there burning right now, okay? This is what we're talking about. We're, we're, we're just being, it's, it's graphic, but it's real. This is the word of God. But Abraham said, child, remember that during your life you received good things and likewise Lazarus bad things, but now he is being comforted here and you are in agony, and besides all this between us and you uh, and a great uh, uh, chase or is something that there's like a barrier has been set so that those who want to go over from here to you will not be able to, nor will any people cross over from there to us. So that now, remember in, in, in the early life, there's a comparison too when Lazarus, was on one side of the gate that he couldn't cross into where the rich man was to get food. Now it's the opposite. Now it's the, the, the rich man who wants to cross over, um, and he can't do that, and no one could cross over. So keep that in mind. And he said, then, I request of you, Father, that you would send him to my uh, father's house. For I have five brothers, in order that he may warn them so that they will not come to this place of torment as well. So the, the rich man is thinking about his family now. But, but folks, this is where it's too late. For any person that dies without the help of Christ, it's too late. Also, another one to consider, for any of us, because look at Abraham, look at uh, Lazarus, it's too late for any of those to make an impact here on earth too. Keep that in mind, but we'll see what, what uh, uh, Abraham says. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. So Abraham is addressing who's going to speak to the rich man's family. He didn't say an angel. He didn't say, he, he, he didn't say oh, yeah, we're, we are going to ri rise up and go and be able to talk to them in a dream. No, 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 no. These are people of God that will speak the word of God. Okay? So keep that in mind. But he said, no, Father, this is the rich man, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Okay? But he said to him, if they, and this is Abraham, and he said to them, if they do not listen to Abraham and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. And, and by the way, keep this in mind. This is Father Abraham speaking, Abraham of Scripture, the Old Testament, and he's saying, and sometimes we think about this, we say, wow, man, and sometimes even me, I got caught with that. Man, God, if you would raise somebody from the dead, and then you'll tell them not to go to hell, not to go to heaven, man, so many people will be saved, and you know what? Some people claim that happens. Uh, I'm, I'm a spectic on that, uh, but I'm going to put that to the side for now, but even with that, many people don't just come to Christ, come to God. All right? He's saying, look, th th still, this is the prophets. You've got to have them. They're the ones. The people are going to speak the word. But he said to them, 
If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even from someone rising from the dead. And that's my last verse with that. So my, my thing is, church, what, what, you know, what are we going to do? This is the first half here now. This is hell. And I, I, so we understand, uh, hell is like, and I, I thought about this, I prayed about this. It's as if someone is committing crimes, right? And the police arrest them. Death arrests people, and then they go to hell. Where when someone is arrested by a police officer, they go to a jail. All right? Keep this parallel in your mind. Now, when someone is, is being going to be prosecuted, they go before a judge. Okay? Now I want to take us to the great white throne judgment in Revelation chapter 20. So now, being seen before the judge here on earth, there's a parallel being seen between God the Father. And again, my focus is the non-believers. That's the focus. So, Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. And, and, and guys, I, I really challenge you, church, to, to look, look at this throughout the week. Really do, you know. And it's not easy. Uh, me you know, when I did a personal study even more in depth than this, um, it, 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 I didn't feel comfortable. I'll be honest with you. It was very uncomfortable. It's not comfortable. It's not something that, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking about, I'm learning about hell, and it's exciting. It's, it's the opposite. You know, however, it's in the Word of God. It's, I, I had to look there, you know, and I know the Lord wanted me to speak on this for a little bit. So hang in there, church. There's going to be encouragement. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and he who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled. And that th there was no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. And the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. The book of life is the book where a, a believer, in context, so we're not, we don't have enough time. That's someone, because they've been redeemed by Christ, they're in right standing with God. That's how our names are found in the, in the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. Now, now church, keep this in mind. He's going to judge every deed. God the Father would judge every deed. He will make every wrong right in the same sense when someone now that has been arrested in jail is seen before the judge, the judge now, he's before a judge. The judge is going to say, okay, this is what you did. You stole $10,000. You also uh, uh, rammed into somebody's vehicle. You also did this. Those will be three separate charges, okay? Keep this in mind. So now, if God were to judge us by, and I'm just going to use three commandments, just three. If he were to ask a person without God's help, how many times have you lied in your lifetime that we can't even come up with a number? Those are upon thousands upon thousands of times in our lifespan. If he said, how many times have you stole in your lifetime? How many times have you dishonored your parents in your lifetime? So this is where being good wouldn't be able to do enough. We need God's help because if he's going to count each individual deed, no man or woman will be able to stand in right standing with God. Because, yes, there's times where we do good. There's times where people do good things. Absolutely. They can help an old woman. Sometimes they don't lie. Sometimes they don't steal. However, when you go before a judge, you're not, you're not necessarily, they're not going to go over what you did right. They're going to go over what you did wrong. And you get prosecuted for that. Now, Revelation chapter 20, 15, and I definitely recommend you, you guys can read the whole chapters of, of this Revelation 20 um, in your own time. And if anyone's name wasn't found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. That's prison. When that, that place hits, there, that's it. That person is never coming back up. That person is never, you know, it's over. And, and so there's, there's theological debate over this too, saying, well, this is just symbolism, this is just that. But keep in mind that even if this, this is just symbolism, there still is a separation, 
right, from that person being with other godly people, okay, there's still a separation here. This isn't a good thing. This isn't a good thing to be separated at all. So I want you to keep that in mind. So, church, now this is where we're going to get uplifted now with spiritual truth. What are we going to do about this? What are we going to do? Are we just going to say, well, that's the pastor's job, the evangelist's job to try to reach the lost? And listen, I'm up front. You, if you ever talk to me, I'm up front. I'll probably never see your, your mom. I'll probably never see your dad. I'll probably never see your neighbor. I'll probably never see, there's exceptions of people that live around the block of the church, then they have seen me. There's some exceptions to some of these things. But I'll probably never see that person that lives, you know, or that gym you go to or the grocery store you go to. I'll probably never go there. But this is where God wants to use you, okay? And, and so uh, the encouragement is there. And, and I, I want to make a distinction. There, there has to be some clarity here. The fivefold ministry, okay, of the title evangelist with the, with the pastor, apostles, and stuff like that, all right, in Ephesians 4 model. That one right there is evangelist that is the one that's encouraging believers, edifying the body and encouraging the body to be able to do the work of ministry, okay? So I am fulfilling that. I understand. Church, understand. That's not your responsibility to do that, all right? So, for example, you probably won't have to set up preachings and teachings to encourage other believers. Also, too, when it comes to getting gospel tracts, uh, locations we're going to do evangelism, uh, getting things recorded, uh, getting the, the care packages, those things I had to coordinate and say, okay, who's going to help me to do these things, right? So I'm coordinating those areas. So you don't have to do that. However, the part of you actually sharing your testimony, you sharing the gospel, that is part of your responsibility too, okay? There's a difference. I, I just want to show, you know, I hope you guys understand that. So now, God's plan is that Romans 5, 8, and this is, what, this is what happens, what he did to help us. God demonstrates his own love towards us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Right? So the, the gospel message, all right, we need to be the ones to tell these people, okay, that are in sin, that are headed to hell, okay, that this is what God did for them. We have to be the one to do that. And I'll tell you right now, church, there's not many of us doing it. And because this one I do do a lot, I ask people, have you heard the gospel message? Do other Christian people talk to you about Jesus? Do you understand why Jesus is significant? The majority, and I'm talking about we, tra we just traveled, went to Boston, Connecticut. The majority of the people hearing the gospel for the first time. And, and guys, and, and listen, and I love the concept of friendship evangelism. I think it's a great tool. The only problem with that sometimes is that if there is no intentionality between sharing the gospel, you can go and meet. And I went, I, I went through this, okay, so I'm, I'm preaching to the choir. You can go for months or years not sharing the gospel with your friend, your coworker, your family, or whoever you're talking to, and you're, you're saying, okay, what well, I'm doing friendship evangelism. So, guys, you got to be careful with that. Eventually, we got to talk about these issues of sin and hell and why we need Jesus and who Jesus is and how to be right with God. We got to talk about all these things. If you're never talking about it at all, there's zero. You're just a friend. That's all. That's all you are. You're just a friend. You're just a coworker. You got to say, Lord, help me. Open the door. What do I do to share the gospel with this person? Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20, and this is the Great Commission, and, and a lot of us are, are really familiar with this. And there's some just, I mean, you know, to unpack this whole thing would, would, would be some time, but I, I really want to highlight some areas here. So Matthew 28, verse 18, 18 through 20. So keep in mind, this is when Jesus, this is where he died and rose from the dead. He tells the women, Tell the disciples to meet me. These are his first words, okay, to the disciples. I want you to keep that in mind. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son 
and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to follow all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I want to go over that word go. The go in the Greek is, means as you go. Keep that in mind, church. So now, as you go to work, as you go to the store, as you go to the gym, as you go to wherever it is that you're going, may the Lord use you to impact someone there. Don't just wait to see our calendar of evangelism and, and just say, well, I just got to go that one time a month or once a year for missions. There's so many people that are around us. And the Lord, his A plan, throughout all New Testament scripture, throughout even Old Testament, he uses people to reach people. He uses people to reach people. So we are the ones that are supposed to go, okay? And, and this goes by disciples of Jesus. Uh, the word disciple means it's a student. It's a learner. Keep this stuff in mind now. A student and a learner, right? Because... I don't feel that I have and have all the knowledge. I'll be honest. I don't know anyone who's like 100%, man, you know what, I know everything. I, you know, I have it all, I have my whole life together. And God's going to, you know, no, I don't, I don't see that. And the, per, the people that I look up to when I ask them questions, they open up and tell me, no, their life is not all together. You know, there's sometimes there's struggle with sin. Sometimes there's struggle in marriage. Sometimes, um, you know, they're still learning, Right? And guess what? I'm bringing this up because that describes us. Church, we don't have it all together. This is why we needed Jesus. We need Jesus' blood to cover our sins, to make us right with the Father. But meanwhile, God wants to use us as we are. And, and, I, and I thought about this. We, you know, when you make a cake or something like that, my wife likes to bake, or somebody who cooks, right, they, they make a mess all over the kitchen, there's pots and plants and eggs and, you know, all over the kitchen, all over the place. There's a big mess. But and then the final product is made, and we're like, wow, this tastes amazing. It looks amazing, this dish. And it takes hours and time to be prepped. I used to think that God has to, like, make us 100% all the way. Then he'll use us. However, the way the Lord works, he uses us as broken vessels while we're incomplete. To so be able to point people to Jesus Christ and say, man, I depend on the blood of Jesus. I need Jesus' help. Uh-huh. So this is what's happening. All right. He's going to use you the way you are. He's going to use you just the way you are. So now I want to go down to Acts 1.8. And these are Jesus' last words. This is, again, after he rose from the dead. These are, he's meeting with the, the disciples. And by the way, Acts. Acts means the Acts of the Apostles. Meaning the things they did, the things they've done. It's not just them uh, reading the word or just hearing word. They, they, they actually did things. They actually moved around and, and shared the gospel. Um, they actually got in prayer meetings and, and things like that. They also, yeah, they did break bread. They ate. But this is the Acts of the Apostles. This is what they've done. That's what Acts means. So now, Acts 1.8, and this is Jesus, this is before he ascends up, and he says this to his disciples, apostles, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and as far as the remote place or parts of the earth. So receiving power, when you look that word up in the Greek, it's associated with power, with might, with strength. Also associated with the work of miracle. So here, Jesus is saying, listen, you're not just going to get the Holy Spirit for love, joy, peace. And that's part of it. Praise God for that. We need that. But he's saying, you're going to receive, when you receive the Holy Spirit, you're going to have power, right? Right? So you could be witnesses. The word witness in the Greek is to witness even unto death. And when you read the book of Acts, they kept sharing the gospel even though they said, we're going to put you in jail. 
we are going to stone you. We are going to kill you. And the disciples kept sharing the gospel. Hallelujah. We have the example church. They seen the, resurre the resurrected Christ, right? And, and guys, that's something we got to get under our belt. That's something we have to learn and say, man, how, what, what is this thing about resurrecting Christ? You know, how, how is this working? How is this? This is why we offer courses and classes on how to identify, how to study, and look into not just biblically, the outside sources that show that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Because what ends up happening is it enhances our faith. It encourages our faith. So I do believe Jesus rose from the dead. And I do believe Jesus' words that we will be present with the Lord. To die, listen, to die is Christ. I mean, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Right? So one day we will be present with the Lord. And so Jesus is saying, you're going to have power to be witnesses. Okay, keep that in mind. Then when you keep reading Acts chapter 1, you're seeing that he goes up. Those are his last words. First words. Last words of Jesus to think about this church is to fulfill the great commission. It's to reach the loss. And we all are different levels. We're, we're, in, we're in different levels of, of spiritual maturity. We're in different levels of our knowledge, understanding of the Lord, um, different upbringings, all kinds of things. But I want to let you know, according to the word of God, the Lord wants to use you. He wants to use you the way you are. Stop listening to Satan Stop listening to yourself. You're doubting yourself out of it. He wants to use you. If you have been forgiven by God of any sin, hallelujah, if you can remember what you used to be, hallelujah, and who you are today, that is your testimony. That is your witness. Listen, there's power there. Christ has forgiven you of sin. He's redeemed you. He's made you a new person. Church, I'm no longer the same. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God, 12 years, 10 years ago, I'm not the same. There's many of you that can say the same thing. And this is where the Lord wants to use you to point to Christ. It is up to you. He wants to use you to point people to Christ. Hallelujah. Now, application. Of course, share your testimony. Of course, share the gospel. Of course, pray, read the Bible. Yeah, we should be doing that. I want to say this, though. When we look at Jesus, and think about this now. Think about the Gospels. Jesus' model was also taking disciples with him. They didn't have not a clue how to minister the Gospel. They were just going with him. I want to encourage people that if you've never gone, never done anything, see me about, let's go, let's go out. Pray about it. Remember, if you say, well, I didn't know much, the disciples didn't know nothing. They, 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 don't, they knew zero. They were fishermen, right? So that's, that's my, my uh, application. Also, I want to encourage you guys. The disciples, what else did they do? They always hung around Jesus. They got into the word. Get into your word yourself. But also, we offer, guys, and this is a blessing, free courses on evangelism, how to share your faith. There's even videos talking to non-believers. There's even videos how to defend your faith. You know, how to, how to uh, again, how to understand why did Jesus, how did he rise from the dead? Is that true or not? What about the Bible? Is it valid or not? What about, why is Jesus the only way? What about the other religions? Church, we got to have the answer to some of these things. We can't just go, go, go to the store and go talking to people and we don't know, a, we don't have a clue. We could educate ourselves. We could know these things, Right? so that we can give an answer for the hope that lies within us, so that we can point people to Christ. So we want to offer that. Um, so on the wakeemupministry.org, there's the courses online there. So you're able, right there on the screen, you're able to go there. Those, those are for free. Again, on evangelism, apologetics. Um, the evangelism schedule is also on there on Get Involved. Also, too, we will be here. Uh, I'm going to be outside at the main door, and I'm going to be giving out uh, resources to you. Okay, the gospel tracks, um, there's some books. Um, there's the care packages, too, which help the homeless. Uh, and, and by the way, guys, some of these homeless people are changing. Some of them are going to rehab. Some of them are going to a, a church closer to where they're at and stuff like that. Um, they are blessed. 
the care packages are helping. It is reaching them. So I want to thank you guys for that. I want to thank you guys too. There's some of you guys giving out gospel tracts. They are reaching people. Amen. We just got to keep it going. And so for those of us who never pass out a track, man, pass one out. Right? As some of you um, never pass out a care package, I encourage you to pass a care package out. As some of you never came out to do the evangelism, I encourage you to come out. Okay? So just stretching out and saying, Lord, use me as a vessel. Use me to do this. So the conclusion is this. We want you to shadow us. We want you to get equipped to share the gospel. We want you to reach the lost within your circles, your family, your neighborhoods, and your jobs, and the stores, and everywhere you go. And as, as much as I can help you, please reach out to me. And if I don't know the answer, we'll pray, and we'll look for someone to get the answer, or we'll look in the scriptures. We'll find the answer to anything that we need, all right? So God bless you, church. I pray that you're encouraged, and God bless you.